All right, so tonight what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a look at the Old Testament once again, the survey class that we started uh, some time ago, and uh, just yesterday I was talking about the survey class. This is coming from Studies of Scripture, a survey of the Old Testament of the Bible Jesus used. And uh, we talked about the canon, or we were supposed to be talking about the canon, and we talked about the canon last night, and my phone went dead, so, you know, I had to start all over again. So what is the canon? Well, the canon has to do with a measuring rod. The word canon means to measure, and uh, it is something that builders use to actually measure buildings before they built it. And so a canon is uh, an unbendable and dependable uh, rod of straightness. Now, when we talk about the canon of Scripture, there is a parallel here. The parallel is that uh, the canon is described as something that is unbendable, unbreakable, and uh, very like a rod, you know. And so uh, as we... Uh, look at the book here. It explains it. It says it's called the canon, and um, and the it's a Greek word here. Uh, and if you look at this Greek word, you can see uh, that's the Greek word, the translation for that. Uh, it's called the canon. Okay, and from uh, this came the idea that truth or a rule of faith. Okay, so this is what the idea is. So um, if we're going to build the scriptures, we need to build them using a straight ruler. And that's what a canon is, kind of like a ruler. And so these people ruled uh, that the canon of scripture uh, would be the books we have today. That's, that's what they ruled on. And it was the uh, Jewish scholars who did this. The same term is used for Paul, used by Paul in the New Testament when he says, peace and mercy to all of the fallen, uh, uh, who, um, all who follow this rule, even Israel and the God of, uh, you know, even the uh, Israel of God. All right. And uh, so uh, anyway, as we look at this here, we can see that uh Paul mentioned that a canon or a rule, a canon was a rule. The same way it was used uh, by Christians to describe those books which set the rule or the standard of faith. Okay, so that's what canon is. So when we talk about canonicity, we're talking about or canonizing somebody, we're recognizing their authority. Now, the Roman Catholic Church talks about, you know, the uh, canonizing people. I don't know if we can actually confer or canonize people, but uh, that, that's one of the things that they speak of. Uh, and also, you know, they, they speak of, um, you know, canonicity is the process by which the book of the Bible were gathered and collected and came as being regarded as the standard or norm for Christian Christianity. Now, uh, this means that uh, canonicity refers to uh, the church. Okay, so the church. Now, here's here's another thing: the church does not determine the word of God. So, canonicity does not make the book into the word of God. It does not. Right? We know that. God is speaking, and God spoke uh, many words in Scripture that we don't have right now. We talk about that in Apocrypha, that that some of the words that have not been um, put into the canon may have even needed to be in the canon. However, uh, this book kind of like confirms that uh, these words that made it into the canon, we ought not ever to uh, question whether or not there is more to go in there than what is. But, you know, it, 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 it depends on how you look at things. I don't know. There, there is the Book of Enoch. There are other books that, um, 
you know, did not make it into the canon. So as we look at this, we can kind of um, make our own decision about this. Because again, canonicity does not indicate that it is the word of God and it doesn't, it doesn't make it the word of God. It just merely recognizes that it is the word of God based upon the character and what they know about God, right? So, all right, it says the books of the Old Testament. Now, let's go move on, and we're gonna move. We're gonna move quickly because we are, we're not gonna take a whole long time tonight. Uh, we talked about the canon of the Old Testament, right? The next thing we need to talk about is the books of the Old Testament. What are the books of the Old Testament, and how are they divided up? Well, it turns out that the books of the Old Testament are 39 books. By most Christians agree that it's 39 books of the Old Testament. However, the Jews have divided the books up into 22 books. So how did they do that? Well, they're the same 39 books. They just have them divided differently. Like, for instance, the minor prophets uh, are in a single book. And uh, then you have 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. That's a single book. So they don't have them divided in First and Second Samuel and all the minor prophets all listed differently or, you know, individually. So that's how they're doing that. So you have 22 uh, books for, for the Jews. And so the Jews look at this as their sacred and holy book. <clears throat> so here, how did they, how did they divide it? They divided up into three sections. And the three sections are the Torah, the Navi, and the Ketuvim. All right, so you have the Torah, and the Torah is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And those are the first five books of the Bible considered to be authored by Moses himself. All right, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are the first uh, first of the, what we call the Torah. Then we move on to what we call the Navi. Now the Navi, Navim, Navi rather, is, is going to be uh, the books that have to do with the f former prophets and then the latter prophets. So the former prophets, they are going to go with Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Samuel, and Kings. And the latter prophets will be Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, Lamentation. Of course, Jeremiah is the author of Lamentation. Ezekiel and the 12 minor prophets. So that's the, uh, the Navi. All right, then they move on. The Jews also have what you call the Kephthim. And these are the songs, which are, again, Psalms, Job, Proverbs, uh, Songs of Solomon, uh, Ecclesiastes, and then Esther, Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, and then also Chronicles. And Ezra and Nehemiah are considered one book there, right here. See, some books such as Ezra and Nehemiah were, cons were counted as a single book. Okay, so this is the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew Bible is the same Old Testament as we have. However, they have it divided differently. 22 books for the Hebrews and for the Christians or people who, uh, you know, again, the denominational Christians would be uh, 39 books. Okay? All right. And then we move on um, and move on past this. Let's move on because we got to get to the Apocrypha. Okay, now um, as we look at this here, uh, let's, go, let's see how how this is divided up. Jesus made reference to the threefold division of the Old Testament. So um, in the Old Testament, in the way Jesus was thinking, he thought mostly like a Hebrew and a Jew. Uh, we again don't have it as a threefold. Uh, for us as a uh, from a Christian perspective and those who are Christians here. 
It says uh, Jesus, however, made reference to the threefold division of the Old Testament in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, when he said everything must be fulfilled in all the law and uh, law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Okay, so that you can see how Jesus divided it up. Because, uh, because the Psalms were the first books of writings, they were um, used as a um, entire collection. And we Christians hold the same books that are found within the Hebrew Bible, but we have a tradition of placing them into a different order. Okay, so let's look at what the order of the Christians are. In, in the Christian uh, context, we look at the Pentateuch, which is the Torah, the historical books, which would be Joshua, Joshua through Esther, which they called the old prophets, and then they called the new prophets, um, you know, which we find the major prophets. Uh, the third part of, of what we what we consider to be uh, the Bible or the Old Testament would be the writings. That would be your prophetic books like Job, Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes, and the Songs of Solomon. Now, in the, and then there's a fourth part, the prof, prophetic books the major and minor prophets. So there's four, there's a four division among Christians. Uh, we divide the Bible up and the Old Testament up into four parts, if you understand. And the, and the, and the Jews or the Hebrews divide it up into three. Okay, so those of you who are Hebrew Israelites or anything, you know that uh, the Bible is divided up in three parts in the um, original Hebrew. Uh, no, all right, we got uh, foundational beliefs. Here are the history, the writing, and the prophets. And then you have the Old Testament is made up of the, the law, the historical books, the prophets, and uh, the, the po po poetic books and the prophets. Now, in the New Testament, we have the gospel, the acts, and then we have the epistles and revelation. In the Old Testament, we have the law, the histor historical books, prophetical books, and the prophets. So you can see how there is parallel between the four parts of the New Testament and the four parts of the Old Testament. Okay? All right, now we're going to move on to the Apocrypha. Now, the prof Apocrypha is um, these are writings that have emerged as part of the Old Testament being part, uh, being included, uh, attempts to include it into the Old Testament. Some of the books that we have in the Old Testament uh, also do have, um, well, some of the books of the Apocrypha are also in the Old Testament in certain cultures. So, but in America, we're going to just look at Again, we have 66 books. We have 39 in the old and uh, 27 in the new. And so um, we're just going to look at it like that. After all the books are made up, our Old Testament has been written. A second collection of books began to emerge. All right. It became known as the Apocrypha meaning hidden away. And a lot of the, it became known as the Apocrypha, meaning hidden away. And a lot of these books the, out of the Apocrypha were actually found, in, they were actually found. So they were hidden away and they were discovered. Now the question is, their authenticity. Were they something that can be confirmed by the prior prophets before them. 
And many of these books were hidden in mystery because they could not. They could not be like, for instance, you can go from, uh, you know, you go down through the prophets, Daniel, um, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, um, um, Isaiah. Many of these prophets, uh, even in the in the minor prophets, overlapped one another. So there was a continuous succession of prophets from one to the other. But in the Apocrypha, they just showed up. These books showed up without any uh, verifiable authors except for the name that was written on the book, right? The book Apocrypha were never accepted by the Jews as having been part of the sacred scriptures. Now, Josephus was a Jewish historian and also a general who had turned historian and a scholar. And he wrote about this whole thing because he, was, he lived during that time in, you know, A.D. 30, uh, maybe all the way up to uh, A.D. 100. So he wrote up to that period of time what was going on among the Jews. And he was not a Christian. He was not a Christian. Uh, he just was someone who was interested in writing about this. And what he did is Josephus wrote about this. And so he kind of gives us understanding that there was a widespread disagreement, disagreement as to whether or not these books uh, should even be included in um, the, the canon of the Old Testament. So the reason is, is that uh, disagreement from the contradicting one another as the Greeks have, but uh, only 22 books which um, contained in the records of all the past time, uh, which are just a, just a, justly believed to be divine. So uh, there, there were only 22 books that they believed to be divine. And remember, those were the three parts, um, you know, the, the three different parts, the Torah, the Navi, and the Ketham. And so they didn't agree, the Jews didn't agree to include the Apocrypha. Now, you can go and figure out why they may have disagreed or didn't want these books included in the Apocrypha, I mean, uh, including into the Old Testament. And maybe they just wanted 22 books to confirm the way they wanted it to be. But these books did show up, and the Apocrypha books are available for people even today to read. Okay, so it says um, the same 39 books that we have in the Bible and understand, you know, were condensed into 22 books in the Hebrew Bible. And so we already, we've already covered that, right? And here they're recovering it again. The Law of Moses, the Torah, and the Prophets, and then the hymns. Again, the Torah, the uh, Navi, and the Ketavim. All right. The, word, uh, the words of Josephus are important because it gives us an important point of an unbiased person from Christ Christian perspective. So he was not a Christian. He just is writing about this. Specifically, he says that there has been an exact secession from, of prophets since the time of the writing of the scriptures ended. So the reason that they accept the 22 books of the Old Testament, which they have ordained to be the official writings, is because of the secession of prophets one to the other. And the reason they didn't include the apocryphal books is because they could not verify the secession from what prophet to the next. According to Josephus, the test of authority for the scriptures was that they were written by one who was recognized as a prophet. And so the previous ones, that because they were recognized by the prophets, because they were recognized by the previous prophets. 
But then a day came when the last of the prophets had spoken, and it um, it was the prophet Malachi. Okay, he foretold that the Lord would come, and the just prior to the to his coming, he would be announced by Elijah. But that's all. That's not all, rather. Notice uh, that Josephus has this to say about the uh, Apocrypha. It is true that our history has been written since. Let's move on and see what he has to say here. Artaxerxes, very particularly, but has been esteemed by like authority with the former by our forefathers because there has not been an exact succession of prophets since that time. And this is what Josephus is saying. So this is the reason he says that uh, they accepted the uh, three parts of the of the uh, the 22 books of the Old Testament, but not the Apocrypha, because there wasn't a succession of prophets. Josephus tells that uh, the Jews rejected the Apocrypha because it had um, not been penned by the prophets and because there had been no unbroken line of the prophets who spoke and who wrote the words of God. Now, I will say this. God has a strange way of bringing things out because many of these apocryphal books were found in caves and they were confirming many of the stories that were told, but they told it from a different perspective, which actually added, especially the book of Enoch, actually added to our understanding, which actually added, especially the book of Enoch, actually added to our understanding of Scripture, so I, I wouldn't rule them totally out. Transmission of the Old Testament. Uh, it talks about the inspiration, um, inspiration, since inspiration by the very definition extends only to the original text of the Bible, and they don't have an original copy of the Old Testament. That's what they're basically going to tell you. They have to use a science called textual criticism. And textual criticism is when they evaluate the writing to see if it lines up with the former writing that was written before. So they take all of the works and manuscripts that are available that have been copies of copies of copies and then they limit the possibility of the original text. We do not, we, we do not have the original pathrus uh, that Moses used to write the Torah. All we have is copies of copies of copies, etc. So textual criticism involves carefully examining the copies to find out what the original text, uh, find out what is the original text. So they compare copies with copies and the one that has the most accuracy with one another, they consider that to be the original text. This has been a very difficult study with regards to the Old Testament, textual criticism. And the area of study falls into four major categories. Now, let's go to the four major categories, and we're going to stop. We're not going to go to higher criticism. We're going to stop right here. The Masoretic text, the Septuagint family, and then the Sumerian Pentateuch. All right, and then also we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay, so we have the Masoretic text, 
was a group of Hebrew scholars who worked at preserving scripture and the tradition of the Jews. All right. They wanted, they, they worked at that. So this, these would be the Masoretic texts. This was a group of Hebrew scholars. Now, this is going to be on the test, guys. It's going to be uh, the Masoretic text is um, the Masor a group of Hebrew scholars or the Masorites or were a group of Hebrew scholars, okay? So uh, you have the Eastern Masoretes who were located in Mesopotamia, and you have the Western Masoretes, and they began in Tib Tiberias, Tiberias. Okay, uh, let's go on to the Septuagint family. This was a Greek translation. So the Septuagint was Greek. Now, the Bible, the original Hebrew, the Bible was originally in, written in Hebrew and Aramaic, or the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew and Aramaic. The New Testament was written in Greek, but the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic. Now, what happened is that you had a bunch of people who were Hebrews who translated. Um, it says this is a Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. That's what the Septuagint is. Now, anytime the Greeks mixed in with the Hebrews, this was what we call Hellenism. And this was created 250 B.C. in Alexandria, Egypt. The problem with the Septuagint was that um, it made no attempt to be word-for-word -word translation. Now, let me explain this. The Bible can be thought for thought or word for word. So a word for word means that they carefully lifted a word off of the text, the original text, in the language that it was written in Hebrew and translated it to an equivalent word in Greek. But the problem with the Septuagint is that the Septuagint was not a word-for-word -word translation. It's very interesting. So there could be thought-for-thought. Thought. And whenever you get into thought-for-thought, thought, you have the other person, the, um, in the, the translator, interpreting for the reader what they believe it to me, and so the Septuagint might be off a little bit here. It says that a wide variety within different copies of the Septuagint. Here we have the Samaritan Pentateuch. Now we're going to go to the Samaritan Pentateuch. The Samaritan Pentateuch differs from the Masoretic text in that uh, about 6,000 instances. Most of these were differences like, mis like spelling, differences in spelling. One interesting difference is seen in Exodus 20 and 17, where the 11 commandment is inserted to build a sanctuary up on the Mount Gerizim. In about 1900, of these instances, the Samaritan Pentateuch agrees with the uh, Septuagint against the Masoretic text. But it's not perfect, guys. You can just see that they added an 11th commandment. That's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> but about 1,900 times it does agree. So... Here's something for people who talk about supernatural changes in the Bible and all kinds of stuff that they say. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's different when it comes down to the Bible being written. And it depends upon what text you're actually having your Bible translated from. 
Last but not least, we have the Dead Sea Scrolls. Discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls has been a profound, has had a profound impact upon the Old Testament textual criticism. Why? Because they didn't have any other way of knowing whether or not, let's say Isaiah wrote the passage where he, you know, talked about Jesus and his coming, except for using textual criticism. But now with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, along with a lot of the apocryphal books, these people in textual criticism now are going to be showed up to see how their science of textual criticism actually worked. On one hand, there was evidence that the Masoretic Scrolls were very accurate in their a tradition of the Hebrew Bible. Or the rendition, rather, I'm sorry. Rendition of the Hebrew Bible. At the same time, it was discovered that there were some Hebrew manuscripts that seemed to follow the Septuagint reading. This indicated that perhaps some of the differences in the Masoretic text versus the Septuagint are not just trans though, but point to a different difference in copying transmission. So um, that's pretty much what I want to talk about tonight, guys. I'm going to go. We, we did cover these three things, and I want to just make, well, that's about four things here. We covered the canon, and then we also covered the books of the Old Testament. And... Uh, we also covered the Apocrypha, and um, we covered the uh, a little bit into the transmission of the Old Testament. And again, all of this will be up online. I'm going to put this up online on coffeewithjesuschurch.org, and there will be other materials that you can download in the PDF file. And also, if you want to get a copy of this, you know, you can go there and you'll be able to get a copy of this information here in the PDF file. Uh, in addition, there will be other materials like quizzes and other things that you can uh, you use if you so believe. Okay, so anyway... Uh, this is it for tonight, and thank you so much for popping in and popping out and whatever you have to say. There's one person says, you know, get a life, and they're on my channel talking about get a life when they are watching the video. <laughs> it's, it's funny. <laughs> you go... You don't have any business, so you get in other people's business. That's amazing. Either way, I'll pray for you. Hey, listen, um, if you love the ministry, like I said, you can go to coffeewithjesuschurch.org and, uh, hey, just tell me and let me know that uh, you like what you see and that kind of thing. And, hey, click on the school, the uh, True Vine Bible School, and check out the Old Testament survey class that we have over there. God bless you. You guys have a good night.